Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have a returning guest. It's been a few years, I believe, uh, Dr. Eric Zelinsky. He's known as Dr. Z. He works on the healing power of essential oils. That's uh, one of his books. That's a national bestseller. He also has the Essential Oils Apothecary, pioneered natural living and biblical health education since 2003. And he's going to talk about a new book coming out in September that he's working on and uh, a bunch of issues surrounding essential oils and chronic disease. So Dr. Z, thanks for coming back. Well, Richard, thanks for having me, buddy. I really, it's an honor and a privilege. I know your show isn't like a natural health podcast, which is why I'm, I very much feel fortunate because this message that we share is so pervasive that it, it literally affects every aspect of your life, right? And so if there's something I could do to help people be more productive, enjoy their life, even, you know, perform better at work, like whatever it might be, they could walk away from this talk with that it'd be a win-win for everyone. I thought, I thought our wonderful overlords, the, uh, the CDC and the WHO are giving us all this great health advice. To, I mean, what could, <laughs> what could you possibly tell people that, that these wonderful organizations haven't gone over to help us? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you know, I, of course we got to be careful here on everything that we say about everything that we say, but yeah. you know, when the solution to whatever it might be that we're trying to face becomes you know, using hand sanitizer that is riddled with chemicals that the FDA weeks later said, oh, hold on a second. These 50 some brands are potentially toxic. Don't use them. And then there's recalls and it just opened up the lid to the fact that, you know, we got to talk about our bodies and our bodies adaptability to what happens around us. And that includes stressors, emotional, mental, physical, airborne threats. And so I will tell you though, Richard, the truth of the matter is I was having a conversation with a friend of mine recently, a colleague, and said one of the best things that this 2020 and 2021 scenario did for us is now immune health. And now people are starting to think about things is front and center. And I'm grateful because the groundwork has been laid for people like me to be like, okay, let's talk about this. So anyway, yeah, we are super excited. And, you know, with our, our brand, our reach online has is essentially exploded. I mean, the natural health industry is just why, because people are now asking questions like you're telling me, Richard, that, that I can't go to McDonald's and eat my double, triple Big Mac, whatever they call it, and then have a multivitamin and think I'm good. Like you're saying that I got to do something different. Like that's really what we, that's really what's happened here. And now, now people are like, so yeah, what I breathe, what I put on my body. Yeah. What I eat that really does affect my ability to prevent chronic disease. And, and that's really the reason why I wrote my new book is because chronic disease is at the forefront of everything 2020 and 2021 related. And so here we are. Yeah, I know there's still, you know, a lot more ways to go, but over the years, I, I kind of realized, you know, I think I was in the shower one day and I was using shampoo and I realized you know, this shampoo, I don't really know what's in it and it's probably going into my scalp mm. and I come out and I, you know, get a deodorant and put it under my arms and that's going into my armpits and to the pores in the skin there. And, you know, I don't wear it anymore, but some people wear cologne or perfume and, you know, some women will put on lipstick and foundation, et cetera. And, and, you know, there's air fresheners and people's cars and people, I guess, are um, inhaling and having various chemicals go into their skin sometimes, I guess, all day long. And now with the hand sanitizer and, you know, masks and rebreathing, you know, your own air. And I mean, what, what are your thoughts on the typical person's body and what they're encountering and uh, what, what they can do about it? The reason why I do what I do, I mean, really, at the, at the core, at the core of why my whole brand, my whole career shifted because I, I didn't go to chiropractic college and invest an unbelievable amount of money in student loans and time 
of my effort, five and a half years to do what I do right now. I mean, this was not part of my, my 10 year vision. It was not on my vision board. And when I went to school, just through a random set of circumstances that ended up not really being random, by the way, kind of, I was developed into this mindset that, that really we have science to back us up, to back up things that we could do to help people live a truly healthy life. And so I've really fell in love with public research as a student and I took the research track and, and lo and behold, one thing that to answer your question, one thing that kept on coming back to me is that it doesn't matter at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much you exercise. And by the way, if you guys want something that will might freak you out, cause it freaked me out like to the core studies okay. have shown. And this really hit me when I read this study, I was shocked because I had a client who commissioned me to write a series of public health reports on Tai Chi. Unbelievable healing practice. Everyone needs to look into it. So I'm diving into literally hundreds and hundreds of research studies on Tai Chi. And one study specifically blew my mind about movement and motion. Research has shown that if you sit down more than six hours a day, and who doesn't, your life expectancy plummets by like 4.2 years, irrespective of the amount of exercise you do. So what does that mean? You have a nine to five job. You're sitting on your butt all day long. You go, you do your spin class at night to burn off your 5,000 calories and you go back home. Guess what? That's just as bad as smoking a pack of cigarettes. And it dawned on me like sitting is the new smoking. And it dawned on me like our lifestyle is not conducive to health on any level. If you're listening to this podcast, chances are you're living in an industrial country, right? Nation, Australia, mm -hmm. UK, America, Canada, wherever it might be. Right. We are living a life in this cardboard wooden box sitting down all day. And then my mind just started going. I started thinking about all these things that you mentioned. Okay, what does this, this cardboard box really look like inside? And when you look at some of the healthiest people on the planet, and if people, if you're listening right now, and if you haven't heard of Dan Brettner, if you haven't heard of the Blue Zones, oh boy, go on YouTube, type up Blue Zones, Dan Brettner, TED Talk, your mind will be blown. It talks about the five areas of the world where people live the longest. They have the highest concentration of centurions, those people who live a hundred years, and there's a commonality around them, one of which none of them exercise. Why? Because their way of life is continual motion. It's continual movement. They're not working nine to five jobs. They're not, you know, sheltering in place, stuck in their home all day long. Like we have been now for now the last year. They're moving. They've got their hands dirty. They're gardening. They're taking care of themselves. Like you see this 92 year old woman on the ground playing with her grandkids. Like just think of it. How many 92 year olds, do you know, can even go on the ground, like get up again. Right. And so, and I'm sorry, I take well, that many, back. How many, uh, here's an exercise for someone that's, you know, 40 and up, lay down on the ground and stand up 10 times, lay down on the ground and stand up. That's really hard, <laughs> even for people that age. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm one of them. I'm not saying I'm not. We all got to, we all have a place to grow everywhere. So again, all these things, you know, to answer your question, all these things matter. And it started to make me think we live such an unnatural lifestyle that's affecting our ability to live a healthy life. It, it's stealing, robbing, not just years, literally years away from our life, but it's robbing the quality of life. Like what is a life sick worth living? I mean, is being bedridden all day long for years on end, is that a life worth living? You, well, I'm not here to make that choice for people. And I certainly would be in that situation. I hope I would be like, yes, I'm going to do my best to maintain my life. But think about the quality of life. And my heart goes out to all the people right now that are literally rotting in nursing homes with no human interaction, just sitting down bedridden. It's like that life right there. And I saw my grandfather. I saw my grandfather. Just, just his life was just robbed in that latter end of his, of his, of his years in sickness, in disease. And I would go to the nursing home and it would just smell the smell of death. It was just like, it was just horrible. 
And you go to him, he was barely like one, one blink away from falling asleep every five seconds and just not even like in this weird state of being constantly medicated to handle drugs, the, the drugs to help with the pain. And, and then so many people are battling with depression and anxiety. It's just like, this isn't human life. This is this weird like zombie state that we're considering normal after you get to be 75, 80 years old. So all that to say, why are we talking about this in essential oils? Well, it's a lifestyle that that I've come to appreciate that the more we can embrace how we were, I believe, designed by God to live, or if you have an evolutionary perspective, how we've evolved over the years, we need to reincorporate that back. And maybe we could talk a little bit about something that really blew my mind recently when I wrote my book, The Essential Oils Apothecary, is about forest bathing and the significance of being out in nature can literally make the difference between whether or not someone is sick or not and how their immune function is handling outborn, airborne threats. So anyway, before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. I am a big proponent. Again, here I am sitting down, looking at a screen, talking to you. Again, I, I get it. I'm in this battle with y'all. I'm an, yeah. I'm a professional digital marketer. It's what I do. I'm a professional writer. I'm in the throes of this with everyone. And I'm constantly coming up with strategies to help my family and I get through this crazy thing that we call life inside, indoors all the time. Well, let's, let's talk about essential oils. So, you know, we talked about it, it was years ago, but how did you come across them and, you know, what did they do for you? How did you get into this world? Yeah, ju- just like I, I had, I mentioned how I had a client commission me to write a series of public health reports on Tai Chi. I was a medical writer and I had a, another client similar around that same time commission me to write a series of public health reports on essential oils. And so it was one of those things where it became my job like it was with that Tai Chi project to dive into hundreds of research trials and hundreds of research studies. And my wife's been using essential oils since she's been a teenager. And I mean, just, you know, I guess to call out the elephant from the room, essential oils. I mean, you know, I'm not like a big burly guys guy. I mean, you know, I, I'm not that, I'm not that kind of guy, but I'll tell you, I didn't want to go (laughs) <laughs> kind of chest, but I was a little hesitant of these things. I mean, really from, from a guy perspective, um, I didn't want to walk around smelling like Elang Lang. I mean, like, you know, my friends would make fun of me. You know what I mean? Seriously, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go mountain biking with my buddy. Just, you know, like here it is walking lavender flower. I mean, that was a thought that I had. <laughs> I mean, seriously, they take my guy card away from me. So I, I was at a point in my life and this was a while ago. This was almost a decade ago. I was a point in my life where I, I was pretty healthy, but big, but I did not have a medicine cabinet filled with remedies for normal medicine cabinet stuff. I challenge everyone listening right now, even to press pause or after the interview, go to your medicine cabinet. What's in it? Chances are you might have a sleep aid pain relief, something for allergic reactions, or maybe seasonal allergies. Maybe you have your whole you know, shelf filled with your prescriptions. Like what's in your medicine cabinet? My medicine cabinet was was pretty much empty. I mean, you know, I had it, I had my toothpaste in it and had some like band-aids, but when it came down to it, what was I going to do if something happened, like I got athlete's foot or whatever it might be, right? I I, I had a little tummy ache. I mean, I'm, I didn't, literally had no Pepto-Bismol, which most people listening probably have Pepto-Bismol or some kind of like acid reflux or, or digestive aid. I was of the mindset at that point in my life and still am that 
um, pharmaceuticals and anything over the counter should only be used unless absolutely necessary. And for me, maybe a guy's guy, I would just grin and bear it. Okay, I'll deal with a little bit of pain. I'll deal with the headache. I'll deal with this. Let, let's find the root cause. So I wouldn't, I can't tell you, it was, it's been years since I've taken an antibiotic. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. I mean, like my children, most of my children have never even like seen a drug, right? They just don't yeah, even know what it's like. It's well, unusual, well, our lifestyle is conducive to that, I think, right? So saying that to say with my healing story, it was nutrition, exercise, prayer, meditation, mind, body, like supplementation, but essential oils weren't part of it. So that was my aha moment, Richard. My aha moment was, what am I going to do when something happens? And around that same time, my baby girl got sick and she developed 104 temperature. Now I'll tell you, most parents and rightfully so they'd freak out at a 104 temperature and they'd probably take their kid to urgent care of their pediatrician. Right. And what happens? They normally give them an antibiotic or whatever. Well, my wife, my wife was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm like, what? We almost had like an argument. I'm like, it's my baby. It's my first baby. Right. I was very protective and you know, mama bear, She's like, no, let's do this first and we'll see what happens. So my wife created this little concoction of, of a carrier oil, like coconut oil. She put it in her hand. She put like a drop of orange and a drop of peppermint essential oil, mixed it together and gave baby. And, and our daughter was like, what, 10 months old, 11 months old. She gave her uh, our daughter like a back and a foot rub. Kid you not. Within an hour, that 104 temperature dropped down to like 101. And I'm like, whoa, what is this stuff? The next day, the temperature was elevated, but it wasn't 104 again. It was it was like, again, in the 101 area. So it was kind of sustainable. So she did it again. And a couple hours later, checked, she's down to like 99. And next thing you know, she was completely well. No antibiotic, no rush to the urgent care. We saved a lot of money, by the way, and we didn't have a lot of money at the oh, time yeah. at all. We didn't have to pay all those co-pays or all that money out of pocket. And I was like, this stuff is no joke. And boom, now it's my job to research about how essential oils can help with hypertension and what it can do for blood sugar balancing. And Richard, I was like, this stuff is legit. This is real plant-based medicine. And so that's what started me. And that's why I wrote my first book, The Healing Power of Essential Oils. And when I wrote that book in 2018, I was not, a, I really didn't know what to expect. Like I wasn't expecting it. Maybe I was pleasantly surprised, but it what, went nuts. Like it was unbelievable how many copies sold. And now it's in nine different languages. It's like almost 3000 reviews on Amazon. It is like the number one best-selling book on, on aromatherapy. And, and all I did was I took a public health perspective of like, okay, what are these things? And let's talk about some basics since then though. And especially because of the 2020 experience and now we're in 2021, I started to realize, okay, what, what, what could be my follow-up to this, right? How, what's the most important topic that we need to cover and can essential oils fill that role? And I kept on going back to chronic disease. And Richard, the reason why I'm telling you the reason why that this is so important and the reason why most people are open to this now is because of this discussion about comorbidity. Most people never even heard of that. They didn't even know what it was unless you went to school, you know, as a healthcare practitioner or frontline worker. Everyone in 2020 was concerned about comorbidities because that put you at risk of developing infection or increased your risk of death. What are we saying here? People that were obese and are obese, people that have elevated blood pressure, 95 plus percent of everyone that are really, really not only getting sick, but of dying due to the pandemic have a comorbidity, a chronic condition. Yep. And it was like, boom, what is this thing? That's why it became important to me. I started digging in. Again, I, I'm, I'm trained in this. So I, I started diving into my own little public health world and I got lost in the numbers for a while. I'm like, this is no joke. Like, this is no joke what people are dealing with and the amount of comorbidities like when you're 65 years old, that's like right then and there. It's almost impossible to find someone without obesity, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, fatty liver, cancer, whatever it might be. And just name the list. Not only counting the people that are deal with quote unquote chronic conditions like low libido, pain, 
insomnia, little things that like, yeah, it's not like the biggest deal, but it like affects your life, right? Like chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia. Yeah, you could still function. It's not going to kill you, but you know what? It makes your life suck. And who wants to have fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue all the time? It's like that just rips your like rips your ability to function. And then this whole mindset came like, why is this happening? Well, you named it. It's our lifestyle. It's this, what we do, what we eat, how we live, what we put on our skin. Richard, your aha moment. I pray to God that people have that aha moment. Like not only is that shampoo you you mentioned seeping into your scalp, but it's the water runoff is flowing down over your eyes, into your mouth. You're spitting it out, but there's a remnant that you're swallowing. You don't even realize it. And then it gets seeped oh, through the God, whole yeah. skin, right? And then the same thing for your cologne because you spray it. And chances are, if you're a woman, you spray it on your, you know, your wrist and put it on the back of your knees or your neck. Same thing with guys. So it gets into your bloodstream, but now you're inhaling it. And those chemicals are now being inhaled through your respiratory system. And here's the key. And oh man, I can't even talk enough about the olfactory well, system. Them, right. If I can give you a quick story, um, my wife was in a car accident. You know, nothing terrible, but you know, the car was total. We had to get a new car, and we got one, and it smelled so much of chemicals, like I couldn't be in it. And you know, we had to leave it with the windows open for days. Uh, she had all the surfaces wiped down, you know, with cloths and all that. And we had a, we had, a, I couldn't ride in the car because I'm sensitive to that stuff. So. It, it took months for to get all that smell and that garbage out of there, you know, off gassing from everything. And, and I vowed never to, to buy a new car again because of that. You know, let, let that stuff come out for the first year or two that the car is out and then we'll buy it. So that was like one, just, just one thing that happened that was important. I'm glad you mentioned because that was actually a good sign. That was a good thing that your body rejected it. Mm. Here's the problem though, Richard. And I'm talking to all you Uber and Lyft drivers out there. Take out the air fresheners. You're poisoning yourself and people. I'll never forget when I got picked up by an Uber and it was the most strong smelling air freshener I've ever, like I actually put my head out the window. I kid you not. What happened was he told me that someone got sick in the car the night before, ended up getting sick, you know, drunk, doing his thing. And he just clean the carpets, but he had to overcome the smell. So he literally just doused the thing with like Febreze. And here he is with his window shut, breathing it in. Here's the problem. He was okay with it. His sense of smell was so dampened, was so deadened. It lost that fight or flight reaction. What are you saying, Dr. Z? Here's what I'm saying. When you put your hand into a fire, not intentionally. I'm not trying to say you hurt yourself, but let's say you, you're, you're at the campfire and you're messing around and you accidentally like touch a flame. What immediately happens? If your body is functioning properly, your pain receptors immediately tell your brain, whoa, hot, get your hand out and boom, instinctively. You don't even think of it instinctively. Well, what happens if your brain receptors and your, I'm sorry, your pain receptors and the brain cascade isn't functioning properly? That's what happens to diabetics, by the way. Diabetic neuropathy, they can't feel their feet. Next thing you know, they have sores on their feet and they they die of sores and gangrene and infection on their feet and other areas because they've lost the sensation of pain. Pain saves you. Pain is your friend. Pain tells you something wrong. What happens if you don't get your hand out of the fire? Your hand will burn off, literally. So that's a a mechanism. You had an olfactory stimulation that said, whoa, this is toxic. I can't handle this. Thankfully, your body was sensitive to it. Your olfactory system, your sense of smell recognized the harm. Here's the problem. How many people have deadened that sense of smell? How many people have adapted to the chemicals where it doesn't bother them anymore? That's actually a red flag. I literally am like you. I cannot go to a big, whatever they call them, big box stores like Walmart. I can't go down that cleaning laundry aisle. It will make me nauseous. I literally have to hold my breath and kind of like skip by that aisle. It gives me a headache. Yeah. I mean, I'm that sensitive. Does that mean? We- I haven't gone into uh, Bed Bath & Beyond in like 10 years at least. It's poison. It's poison. And here's the problem, Richard. I used to be like, oh, I like this smell. No, that like that is if you enjoy the smell of fake chemicals, I'm telling you something. That is a red flag that your body, your olfactory system isn't functioning 
properly. You've deadened those nerve cells where they can regenerate. Your sense of smell is at the primal core of who you are. This is where we kind of get fun. This is our, this is when it gets fun. This is when we kind of can get deep here. In the book that I just wrote, I cover this in depth because our olfactory system has a direct connection to the brain where our limbic system, our limbic function is housed. Our mood, our memory, our emotions, and autonomic function like breathing, heart rate, and blood pressure, all through smell. Smell is at the primal core of who we are as humans. Smell and the way it interacts with our limbic system really is only one step away from the reptiles and one step away from other mammals. I want, I want to go back. I want to go back to who we are as just as mammals. It is absolutely important that we acknowledge the true impact of what it is that we inhale because otherwise we put ourselves in an extreme disadvantage where it causes a noxious, toxic reaction. Again, everyone's talking about airborne threats in the guise of a virus. I'm talking about airborne threats in the guise of artificial fragrances. And you're talking about VOCs, the off-gassing from building materials and carpets. Well, when you breathe that in, it lets your brain know, similar to the fact, similar to when you put your hand into a fire, it lets your brain know there's, there's poison here. And that creates an inflammatory response in the brain. We all know about inflammation, right? It's a big buzzword in our space. Inflammation is there to protect you. Inflammation is there to say, hey, let's heal you. Inflammation is not, we're not a mechanism that's supposed to be in constant motion. It's supposed to be there, do its function, and stop. The problem the past year is that the language around all of this has, has changed to fool people to think that good things are being done. You know, oh, this this area has been sanitized. You know, this this has been cleaned. This is, and it's not, it's the opposite. They put all kinds of, you know, cleaners and chemicals on stuff that are volatilizing and getting on your skin. And, you know, I got a, a I went to a chiropractor, it was a bunch of months ago, and they, they keep cleaning the tables too much. And I got like a huge rash in my arms. So I tell them when I come in, mm. don't clean the table, just give me the filthiest one. That's the one I want. And they laugh. I'm like, I'm serious. I got a rash. I, I can't go on these clean tables. They're no good. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I have a chapter in my new book about Alzheimer's and dementia. And just between us, I had a little disagreement with my publisher about one part particularly because, you know, I, I, I'm definitely biased. I mean, we all have our own biases. That, that's who we are, right? And I have an agenda. My agenda is to help people at the core. I'm not selling essential oils, by the way, everyone. I don't actually don't have a product line. That, that's what I do. I educate. My agenda is to help people live as natural as possible so their body can heal itself. And then again, if you need it, like I did when I had an argument with my car door, eight stitches later, no lavender was going to heal that gaping wound. I'm telling you, and I was okay with them giving me a local anesthetic because I didn't want a needle through my head without a pain relief. So I'm not a fanatic. I'll go to the hospital if we need to. But when it comes to this mindset, the disagreement became about over sanitation. And in my book, I quote a study that was conducted across 192 countries, pretty much the whole world, right? This is in an Oxford journal proving a strong link between over sanitization, wealthier countries, and higher rates of Alzheimer's. The reason why, and this isn't me, I'm not saying this, and that's my disclaimer. The reason why is the study suggests that the lack of bacteria create, because of over sanitation, creates a poorly developed immune system, which puts your brain at risk for inflammation. And if that happens over time, which we're all living this, you're at an infinitely greater risk of developing dementia and Alzheimer's. And so when I put this in my book, my publisher's like, whoa, 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 aren't you going against the public health advice that everyone needs to hand sanitize and blah, blah, blah? I'm like, well, we have to have a discussion here. So yes, I am giving a contrary or let's say alternative opinion according to the research about let's weigh the risks and the benefits here. So what are we trading off? Are we trading off an antiseptic environment that potentially could kill a virus that would maybe put ourselves in a position where now we're going to develop Alzheimer's and dementia? What is the risk? What are the benefits? 
Because I'm telling you, Richard, no one has been talking about this. No one has been sharing about the risk, at least at the mainstream level, the risks of hypersanitation and what it does to us at the neurological level. I agree. Yeah. Well, you're not allowed to talk about it lately, you know, in a lot of forums. So yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, we have to speak in code words. Essentially, it's what I'm doing right now. I got to be very careful. We have to. So basically, my message in my book in, in this Alzheimer's dementia chapter is think twice before using hand sanitizer. Don't forget. Our grandparents and great grandparents, they they lived a relatively healthy life, right? Um, hopefully they did. And they use good old fashioned soap and water. I mean, the idea is these I think, anti- I think yeah. though I just realized I think the perception is is that people did not live healthy lives in the past. I think I just have that feeling that that's the current perception of people is that, you know, people in the olden days, quote unquote, they only lived till thirty or they didn't live long and their lives were terrible and difficult and they weren't healthy. And now with modern medicine and all that, we are healthier. But I think it's gotten to the point where that's probably no longer true. At least, at least you know, it, it could be vastly, a vast difference, you know, meaning like our health today could be vastly inferior to the past. But we, we really can't know that. I think, again, people's perception is skewed on it, is my guess. But what's your thought? Yeah, I've heard that a lot, actually. I've heard that is that, well, our life expectancy is greater. Well, that's impossible to prove. And maybe within the last hundred years, because we do not know what the life expectancy was five, 600 years ago. But let, let's point out something though, discounting the bubonic plague, you know, discounting the dark ages, like there were seasons. And again, this, this is where, I don't know where your historical viewpoint is, anthropological viewpoint, your religious viewpoint, but let's say, for example, you're Jewish or you're Muslim, or you're Christian, which most people listening identify with one of those main world religions, I mean, statistically speaking, you look at your ancient scriptures, and you read people regularly in their 80s, 90s, and 100s. And well, are we looking at this as allegory? Are we looking at this as, you know, there's a story in the book of um, Deuteronomy, I believe it is, right? Let's go back to the the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures about, about Caleb, 80 years old, being like, I'm going to go fight this battle. Like there's a story about this man. They mention in the Bible, it mentions specifically he was 80 and he had vigor and strength like he was 40, right? I mean, Moses supposedly died when he was 120. I mean, anthropologically speaking, that was only a couple thousand years ago. So yes, to your point, we had these dark ages where the problem was the lack of sanitation. I mean, cesspool environments where people are like bathing and and the same drinking water, like they didn't have a concept of remember, I don't know if you know historically, but the the concept that a cert or a, a concept that an obstetrician, a doctor should wash her hands or his hands at the time, most men were doctors Ben or doctors were men back then was completely foreign to them. Like you're saying, I have to wash my hands before and after surgery, you know, like they weren't thinking that way. And so of course they would spread infection. There was this season of just ignorance, rampant ignorance. And so when you get to the 20th century, they realized, oh, wow, yeah, we got to wash our hands before and after surgery. And yes, we need to do these certain things. And yes, we need to separate our cleaning water and our drinking water and our sewage system shouldn't be all connected. Like, you look at London, London was a cesspool of disease for just years and years and years, just because they didn't know how to properly live. Well, you take that out of the equation. Those people lived a relatively healthy life. And you know how I know? Let's go to the blue zones. These are areas of the world that are relatively untouched, relatively untouched by the, I would say not untouched. They, they, they have conveniences, but they've adopted some but they maintain a lot of their traditional lifestyles. So that proof in and of itself, when Dan Buettner came out with this with the National Geographic years ago, you know, places like Sardinia, places like in Okinawa, Japan, these people live a traditional lifestyle. They're living to their hundreds regularly. And so, well, how can these people do that in these little areas around the world to this day, like today in 2021, but other people aren't? Well, there's got to be another reason. And you look at their lifestyle. It, it's simple. It's simple. They use basic common sense when it comes to cleaning things, when it comes to living. But it's a lifestyle that 
to your point, that's been the lie. The lie is that, well, you know, look at so-and-so and and, and look at this, look look at the life expectancy of, no, 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 no. Let's take a big picture here. And for people that look from a historical anthropological perspective, the blue zones are like, wow, they're like the missing link. And I hope people are motivated to learn more about that, which is actually why we talk about the blue zones in our book too, because it reminds us that we could live that today in our own little microcosm. Well, one movie that I'll never forget is The Goonies. Um, you know, I'm in my 40s and stuff. So The Goonies came out, and I remember there was a kid in the movie named Chunk, and he was, yeah. you know, by today's standards, he wasn't even heavy. And I remember he got up on the fence, and he, like, jiggled his, his belly fat. Yep. And they teased him. But, you know, back in the 80s and stuff, there was, like, a token fat kid. Yep. But everyone else was pretty much thin. And now, overweight people, are, and I'm one of them, too, but overweight people are everywhere and I see it in kids and adults and all this other stuff and people waddling around and you know again I'm not thin so I'm, I'm not criticizing whatever but I can just see it I've lived long enough to see like this dramatic change in people this fattening of everyone it's rampant it's rampant and we're in a we're on a pace where 50 percent and including children one in two people are pre-obese or will be obese or pre-diabetic. And there's this thing called diabetes, by the way. I cover that too in depth in my book. Why? Because they're inter- intricately linked. And you know, this is something not to be condemned about, but two wrongs don't make a right. And so the Goonies, that was a horrible situation. They shamed him. They, it was virtual signaling, you know, you're, you're fat, you're fat, right? Well, now it's like the pendulum has swung so much on the opposite direction where now we're celebrating people for being overweight, where now you have these plus size models that are really like, this is the new beauty. And I'm telling you something, it's a dangerous place to be. Again, I don't want my 12 year old daughter to look at Twiggy. Remember Twiggy, for those of you old enough, remember Twiggy as the model. Now she's going to be anorexic and bulimic and she's going to do what she does. Like that's again, that's the extreme. But I also don't want my daughter to look at a woman clinically obese who's at risk now of premature death and a slew of diseases to be like, wow, that's beautiful. Like that's healthy. That's not healthy. And we need to hold ourselves accountable to like, look, we all need to grow and we all need to get better. And again, two wrongs don't make a right. Why can't we find a middle ground here somewhere? And the reality is we have some work to do. And so like, why are we talking about this in a discussion with essential oils? Well, there are certain things you could do to help your body function better and heal better. And the reality is, Richard, If I were to tell you, well, this is what you got to do, and this is the amount of exercise you have to do, and this is how you have to change your diet, and whoa, you're like, whoa, 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 hold on a second. It's overwhelming to a lot of people. But if I give them a prescription or some ideas that you could easily incorporate through maybe a couple different supplements, maybe some essential oil therapy, and you start to feel better, look better, and slowly start to shed some pounds... Well, I just set you on the right direction and you had to do minimal effort. I'm telling you something. When it comes to essential oils and aromatherapy, it's the lazy person's way of getting well because it doesn't take an entire life change where obesity, diabetes, cancer, autoimmunity, all these conditions, these chronic conditions, they take life changing that is expensive, that's overwhelming for a lot of people. And no joke, research has shown that if you literally just inhale lime essential oil, your body starts to stimulate lipolysis at a slow, steady level. What's that mean? It starts to break down fat. What? In inhaling lime oil? Yep. Same thing with grapefruit oil. If you were to ingest through like a little gel capsule, a couple drops of cinnamon bark essential oil, that increases insulin sensitivity. What's that mean? That could help balance blood sugar. What's that mean? That could help you lose weight. What's that mean? That puts you at infinitely less risk of developing chronic disease and other comorbidities, little things like that. And that's why I love it because I could tell anyone, Hey, you're battling with sleep issues. Well, try these, a couple of essential oils like lavender or bergamot or Roman chamomile, put in your diffuser. Anyone, anyone can put lavender three, four drops in a water diffuser, pay 20 bucks, get a water diffuser on Amazon, get a couple dollar bottle of lavender, put a couple drops in it. Like that's how simple it is. That will help you. That could put you in this parasympathetic rest and digest state that could calm anxiety and stress and help you sleep better. 
It's a lot easier than saying, okay, well, let me give you this 15 step checklist to change your whole life. No, that's where I got to tell you, people and myself included, we're looking for quick, easy, low hanging fruit. And nothing is quick, easy, low-hanging fruit as essential oils. And I'm not making cure-all claims. That's really important. That's a big disclaimer here. I'm not claiming cure-all. I'm claiming support. I'm claiming relief. I'm claiming symptom management, unlike you maybe have experienced before with, and this is the key, zero side effects if you use them properly. And Everyone listening will be hard-pressed to find any drug or over-the-counter that has zero side effects in it. It's impossible. Every single one does by virtue of them being synthetic. But there is no risk of eating an orange unless you're allergic to orange. In the same way, there's no risk of using orange oil unless you're allergic to oil. With essential oils, again, from just an outside perspective, I just think, okay, they're for relaxation. You know, a few drops of lavender or something, and you relax in a bath with bath salts or something, but I don't think much of essential oils beyond that. So what, what are some of the things that essential oils can do that you haven't yet talked about? Richard, we're, you know, this again, blew my mind, right? As I started doing this research years and years ago, where do we think chemists and pharmacists come up with the chemical structures for the drugs that they formulate? It's not like a chemist wakes up in the middle of the night and she gets a vision and she's like, oh, wow, let's just create these hydrogens and atoms, carbons together and create like a pill. No, they base it off the chemical structures of what we see in plants. Perfect example is aspirin. Our ancestors for years have been using willow bark. It's a known analgesic for pain. It's a known analgesic. You you create a salve, you create a poultice. Well, if you extract the, it's known as salicylate. If you extract the chemical from willow bark and chemically manufacture it, put a white shiny pill on it, we call it aspirin. Well, why not use an essential oil like wintergreen or another one that has similar chemical properties that has a natural pain relieving pro- ability? Just to point out, Again, this is a big aha moment for a lot of people. When I learned it, I was like, wow, before the antibiotic in the mid 40s, combat medicine in World War I and World War II, combat medics on the front lines of the war were using essential oils to combat infection. That is what I'm talking about here. This is actual medicine. So to answer your question, what can they be used for? Well, virtually anything like you would use any sort of plant-based herb or spice or anything that you see it in herbalist apothecary, anything from pain to stress to anxiety to libido to balancing blood sugar, bl- balancing blood pressure. Like that's why in my book, I cover chronic conditions because I'm trying to get my biggest bang for my buck here. Meaning I want to help as many people as possible. And chances are whether you have fatty liver disease Alzheimer's, dementia, whether it's chronic um, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, whether it is asthma or anything inflammatory related, there are strategies and research has shown it. There are strategies you could use plant-based compounds, aka essential oils to help. And so this is where we get in trouble in my world because there's a phrase out there. There's an oil for that, right? It's like anything you got, I got the solution. And that's where it's like, okay, again, it's very important to say we're not claiming that essential oils are going to cure you of death, but looking at our ancestor, looking at how herbal apothecary, how plant-based medicine over the years has evolved into modern pharmaceutical-based medicine the linchpin of all of it are the essential oil. What's, what's a typical day in your house? Like, what do you brush your teeth with? What do you eat? What do you, when do you use essential oils? You know, what's an example? Yeah, we, here's the thing that I'm trying to pose to people. And one of the, one of the reasons why we were setting the stage about this toxic lifestyle is, is that overuse of toxins, overuse of chemicals, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt can cause chronic inflammation. And that produces a slew of issues, right? Every chronic condition right now, everything from heart disease to diabetes to obesity to cancer is linked to chronic inflammation. So at a core, what we've done is we have detoxed our home, which means we've looked at every product, everything that we consume, use, and we've either make our own which I have several recipes in the book to show you how to make your own little things like hand sanitizer and how to make your own whatever it might be, soaps and lotions and potions and things. Or we buy 
non-toxic versions. And the key for us is, especially because, you know, we're on a budget too. We have five children. If you buy something unscented, you could easily put a couple drops of your favorite essential oil in it. And now you got your favorite shampoo that's boom, enhanced in a good way. And so quite frankly, the less ingredients, the better. You want to be able to read an ingredient list like you hopefully do on your food label. You want to ingre- and read the ingredient list on your products, your body care and your cleaning products, and at least recognize that, okay, is this good? Is it not good? Maybe I need to do a little bit of homework. But you end up trusting brands. You do. You end up trusting brands. And like Dr. Bronner's is a, is a good one, for example. If I'm not making it, if my wife and I aren't making our own toothpaste, you know, you could get Dr. Bronner's toothpaste. It's, it's simple. It's effective. It's completely non-toxic. They're also the same company that makes Castile soap, which is completely safe that you can easily now make your own hand soap, dish soap, um, even laundry soap. Like there's a lot of different things. And, and again, I get the fact that we're busy. And I get the fact, especially with us, with a family of seven, I can't DIY everything. So that's why we we really try to balance this whole equation. So to answer your question, what does a daily life look like? It looks exactly like yours, but we use products that we know won't hurt us. And how do we, and that's how really we use essential oils. Like I don't wake up in the day unless, by the way, it's flu or cold season. We usually ramp things up because, you know, once the kids are at school, they get some colds and sniffle. Now the flu and cold seasons become, I am think now it's going to be the COVID season. Like that's going to be the new term for it. You know, the flu, cold COVID season, right? Um, when when this happened a few months ago and everyone started getting sick, well, yeah, there are a couple strategies and we actually included in the book are immune boosting strategies proven by research to help enhance immune function and fight infection. Like we'll do that. We'll, we'll put a couple immune boosting um, diffuser blends into the diffuser. We'll eat my, and I'll give you the recipe, my immune boosting snack, which tastes like candy. The kids love it, but I know it helps us. We'll do that prophylactically, but a day to day, well, what do you want? And for me, it all depends on the day. Like for example, today, um, I kind of, you know, here I am interviewing with you. Um, I don't want to really be chilled out and relaxed. I mean, most people don't want to hear someone monotone and I'm talking a lot. So I I got a diffuser blend with peppermint, with orange, with some um, fir trees. And again, remind me to talk about forest bathing, like, cause I want to be on, I want to be focused. I want to be energetic. So I use the essential oils that I want to produce the mood and the productivity that I'm trying to accomplish. Well, I don't really want this at night though. When I'm chilling out with my wife and I'm getting the kids ready for bed, I want those soporific calming oils to help create that like relaxing environment where then I want to get to sleep. I can decompress. So our day-to-day life is really, okay, what are we trying to, what do we want today? And it might sound hokey. It might sound crazy. It might seem far-fetched, but you can literally transform the environment in your home by what is being emitted in the air. That's why if you want to inv- if you want to be in an environment that smells like sickness and disease and yuck and just not having joy, like you're going to bottle up the smell in a nursing home and you're going to put that into your diffuser and you'll be like, oh, this is, you know, this is going to take me down five notches and make me depressed. But if you want to flip that's on its head and why am I mentioning this? Because they've done studies where nurses in hospitals and nursing homes literally just put diffusers in their station, the workstation, and put citrus oils like orange, lemon, lime, I mentioned before, bergamot, neroli, and just have those essential oils diffusing throughout the day. And it drastically increases their quality of life. Their work-life balance, their joy, their happiness, their energy, just by having that, it like transforms the yuck and the muck of being in a hospital and nursing home into like, wow, I can, it's more manageable. Like you have that power in your home. So let's say you want to prepare for a presentation at work or at school. Well, get some focused concentration oils that we've seen can help with meditation and clear away distraction. Like why our ancestors used to burn leaves and resins to help meditate while well, frankincense, myrrh, sandalwood, all of the tree oils, like what are tree oils? Douglas fir, cedarwood, silver fir, this kind of thing. Like you diffuse that, it could put you in a state of mind. 
it actually puts you in a neurological state of mind of focus. And so again, what do you want? And for us, it's kind of fun where we know we have that power at, at, at our hands. Well, very good. Dr. Z, we're, we're close to the, uh, to the hour mark and at a time. Um, so your book's coming out in September. What's it called? But in the meantime, how do people um, get on board with you? Where can they go to find out about uh, essential oils? Yeah, our book comes out September 7th. It's called The Essential Oils Apothecary. And if you want to get a good one-on-one version, like a good basic primer and all kinds of recipes on how to use oils throughout your house, I encourage you to pick up my first book, The Healing Power of Essential Oils. And it's actually my new books available for pre-order today right now, everywhere books are sold. You just type up essential oh, cool. oils apothecary. And uh, when it comes out on September 7th, you'll be the first one to get it. And and let's go on this chronic disease prevention road together and using aromatherapy. Excellent. Well, Dr. Z, thanks for coming. Also, your website, what is it where people can visit? Yeah, my website's naturallivingfamily.com. Excellent. Well, Dr. Z, thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me again. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.